Amen. All right. Let's take our Bibles, please. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9 this morning. Children, you are dismissed. Let's dismiss quickly and quietly. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I should, I should let you know that Brother Lipsky is home from the hospital. So he's at home this morning. Uh, his son-in-law is there with him and some grandkids apparently and uh, kind of tending to him, but he's not hospitalized, all right? So uh, whatever stroke he had, I, I, I never want to say a minor stroke. How many of you know that something's only minor when it happens to somebody else? but when it happens to you. And so I don't know uh, all that's going on, but let's pray. My wife and I'll stop by and see them on the way home from church this morning and make sure they're okay. But I uh, appreciate our Brother Ferrier checking in on Brother Lipsky and letting us know this morning. And so uh, be in prayer for them. I just got an email during church updated on the prayer list that uh, Jennifer Simmons is coming home today. Uh, she'll be on antibiotics for a little bit, but she's doing well. So praise the Lord for that. All right, and I hope you had a good week. We had a great week. We, we slipped away for a few days to Edmonton and uh, spent time with our son Brendan and our daughter-in-law Emma and our grandson Bowden. And Bowden just turned one a couple weeks ago, and people are saying, well, is he walking? No, he's running. And he's running faster than me. I can't keep up with him. And when I say running faster than me, my speed is zero when it comes to running. My kids used to joke with me because I'll say, well, I'm going to go put on my running shoes. And they say, running shoes? Dad, they're just shoes when they're yours. <laughs> they're just shoes. And so anyway, uh, but he's fast. And I mean, uh, we call him the little octopus the way his hands go, but he was a lot of fun. And uh, praise the Lord for grandkids. And uh, so we had a good time with them. And I hope you had a good time uh, with your family this week. And we praise the Lord for our families for sure. Um, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9 this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we have been looking at the life of David, a man after God's own heart. And just a four-part sermon series that I've been doing on Sunday nights, but as I developed this message throughout this week, it just felt like it was more of a Sunday morning message. And we looked, first of all, at David's calling. You'll remember Samuel went down to Bethlehem, and there he found Jesse and his sons, and they paraded before the prophet Samuel, but not one of them was to be king. And Samuel said, are these all thine sons? And Samuel, or Jesse said, no, there's one, but he tendeth after the sheep. And when David came before him, he recognized right away that this was the Lord's anointed. And he anointed him to be the next king of Israel. And of course, that has taken some time. There's been some transition take place as Saul has managed to hold on to the throne for, for several years and even a divided kingdom for a time. But then we moved on to the, the next week. We talked about David's courage. And you remember that David fought Goliath, probably the most famous story of the Bible. If we were to say what is a, a story of the Old Testament to the children that just left this room, they would maybe pull out David and Goliath. That would be one that they'd remember. Maybe Daniel in the lion's den or Jericho or something like that. But David and Goliath certainly is a wonderful picture of David's courage because he learned who he was, but he also understood who he was. The Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and certainly he will deliver the head of this uncircumcised Philistines into my hands today. Amen. He understand who he was, but he also understood who he was. And then last week we looked at David's comfort. The Bible says that David learned how to encourage himself in the Lord. You remember that David was in a cave and he was struggling uh, in the cave of Dulam. And, and as, he, as he considered all those things, he understood the word encouraged. We learned last Sunday night, the word encouraged means to anchor yourself to something firm. And I think that's good. I, I, I've been swimming before and that when you're swimming, sometimes you lose your footing and you're just looking for that bottom. You want to get your feet down. Have you ever been with a kid and they're swimming and they're panicking a little bit and you say, just put your feet down. And when they put their feet down, they stand up and realize it's only knee deep. But when they cannot feel the bottom and you cannot see the bottom, you are lost and drifting around. But when you put your feet on something solid, and that's what that word encourage means, to anchor to something firm. And we learn that through the Psalms that David wrote uh, hundreds of times the word rock. God is my fortress. God is my strength. God is my strong tower. Over and over again, he repeated those words because he understood that true encouragement comes from fastening ourselves to the rock, which we know is Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to spend some time as we close out this series after God's own heart, speaking of David's compassion. David's compassion. 
He said, why would this be a Sunday morning message? Because in this portrait of compassion, that's my first point, we will see a picture of Christ and the compassion that he has for us. When I begin to think about the compassion of David and reading through First and Second Samuel, there was a story that jumped out at me, and it was the story of Mephibosheth. How many of you have heard of Mephibosheth? A few have. How many of you ever named your child after the biblical character Mephibosheth? I learned that through this study, I learned that we're pronouncing his name wrong. It's Mephibosheth. It has an I in it, but it's pronounced like two long E's. Mephibosheth. I wondered, did they call him Phoebe? Did they, I don't know what they called him. Maybe they had a nickname for him. But his name is Mephibosheth, but I'm going to say Mephibosheth because that's all we really know. Mephibosheth was a young man, and we read about him in 2 Samuel chapter 4. And why don't we start there instead of chapter 9? Let's back up. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to read every passage in the Bible about Mephibosheth. You went, oh, no. There's only about 20 verses in the whole Bible. So it's not that hard. But I want you to get a picture of his life and understand what we see as we consider David in this. First of all, I'm, I'm going to say my very first point, a portrait of compassion. I only have two points this morning. A portrait of compassion. And I want you to notice where this compassion starts. And we see, first of all, there's a tragic condition. Look back in 2 Samuel chapter 4, and we see a tragic condition. The Bible says, And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of the bands, the name of the one was Bena, and the name of the other, Rakah, the sons of Ramon and Abarthothite, and the children of Benjamin, for Baroth also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Barothites fled to Gideon and, there, and, and were sojourned there until this day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this story in the Bible. And as David sits upon the throne, we know that Jesus Christ now sits on David's throne. We are thankful that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the king of the Jews. And he has taken David, a man after his own heart, Lord, the apple of his eye. And Lord, to, to illustrate to us today the very compassion of Christ for our souls. Lord, I don't believe it's a coincidence all the things that we see here. And knowing that David being the king and Jesus Christ being the king of kings that we can draw these principles today and apply them and help us, Lord, to see very plainly the compassion that Christ has for us. Maybe there's somebody here today, and I've heard so many say over the years that God is an angry God. But God is justly angry. He has a righteous indignation against sin, for it destroys his creation. God, I can honestly say as as the people of this church that we hate cancer. We hate disease. We hate these strokes that we've heard about this morning because they destroy our loved ones. And so God hates sin in the very same way. The Lord will pour out his wrath upon a lost and dying world, but Lord, for those that find the compassion of Christ, for someone here today that that would just turn their heart and their soul to Jesus Christ, he would save them if they would only believe. And so, Lord, we pray for your power and your spirit to speak to hearts today. Oh, God, help us, we pray. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A portrait of compassion. David was a lot of things in his life, but we understand that as, as all of our lives go, we, we are often marked by the worst things, aren't we? We often, if I were to hold up, I, I've seen this illustration at youth rallies before. If we were to hold up a white sheet up here before you today, and maybe it's seven feet long and it's five feet wide, and, and we'd had a couple men hold that white sheet up, and we were to put a black dot in the middle, we'd say, what do you see? And everybody would say, I see a black dot. 
I see a black dot. That's often how we reflect on a life, isn't it? We think of a David and we think of the things that he did and often our minds go to Bathsheba rather than Goliath. We think of the, the wicked things that happened in his life and maybe his fear in the cave of Abdullam and maybe his doubt at other times, but uh, there's a lot of good things that David did as well. And I want you to see this morning his compassion. It starts with a tragic condition. There's a boy by the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is reflective of something else as well. We often think of Saul in the same light. We think about the wicked things that Saul did. But you know that even in Saul's dark days, do you know what the name of Mephibosheth means? It means to drive away the idols. It means the dispeller of shame. There was something that happened during the life of Saul that Saul decided, let's tear down some of the high places and let's drive out the idols of Baal. And so they named Mephibosheth in honor of that feat. That's an interesting thing for me because by the time Mephibosheth born, the spirit of God had already left Saul. And there was a difficult time in Saul's life and yet he still managed some good, it seems, as this son was named after this dispeller of shame. And we see that Meshibosheth, as they were fleeing away at five years old, his maid dropped him or he fell to the ground in some way. And the Bible says he was crippled. His feet were crippled. I don't know how badly they were crippled. I don't know if he needed a walking stick. I don't know if they made some sort of wheelchair for him. I don't know if they carried him around on a pillow. I don't know what the condition was, but the Bible says he was crippled in his feet. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll read that many years have passed before David shows compassion on Mephibosheth, and by then he's married and has his own son. And so he was able to, to, to raise up and perhaps work a job and, and get a family. We don't know all the details, but we know that he had a fruitful life somewhat, even though he was lame in his feet. You know, compassion often starts with a tragic condition. The Bible says, mine eye hath affected mine heart. And we often see things and allow God to work in our hearts through those things that we see. How many times are we moved by a missionary video? It's interesting that missionaries will often put pictures of children. Have you noticed that? It wasn't long ago that, that uh, we had a missionary come through that was going to Africa, and they had put some stock photos up. You say, how do you know they were stock photos? Because one of the pictures they had in their video, I took in Africa several years ago. I had taken the picture, and I put it up on our Google Photos, and I let them share, and, and I saw that photo. I said, my wife, I took that photo years ago in Africa, and they found it online and used it in their video. It draws compassion, doesn't it? You see those sad faces and the flies and, and the malnourished bellies, and our hearts are affected by what our eye sees. David had compassion because of what he knew. You'll turn, if you will, to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and I want you to see how this story progresses as we look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, it says, And David said, is there, any, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David loved Jonathan. The Bible says their hearts were knit together, and David loved him dearly. Jonathan saved David's life many times over, and David and him were the best of friends. And so David said, is there any left of Saul's household that I might show a kindness unto Jonathan? Now I'm gonna suggest to you something this morning and I can prove it from scripture, but I won't prove it just yet. There were many that were left of Saul's family. We're gonna see at least seven more later on in our message this morning, but there was many that were left of Saul's family, but immediately somebody came to mind. And so the Bible says that David said, I, I wanna show compassion, I wanna be, uh, show a kindness, I wanna show something because I love Jonathan. And the Bible says in verse two, and there was, a, there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, art thou Ziba? And he said, thy servant is he. And the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son who is lame on his feet. 
If we're going to talk about the compassion of David today, we must also mention the compassion of Ziba. For immediately, when we know there's other family members, and David says, is there anybody left of this household that I can be a blessing to, that I can show kindness to, that I can have compassion upon? Immediately, Ziba's mind went to a fellow by the name of Mephibosheth, who was lame in his feet, a son of Jonathan. Verse 4, and the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Machur, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. I want you to notice as we think this morning, first of all, we see a tragic condition, but I want you to notice a targeted compassion. A targeted compassion. David showed compassion on somebody specific. His eye affected his heart, and when he heard about this young man now, and a father that that was struggling because of the, the lameness of his feet, he decided to show compassion. And we see in those first four verses that we read, compassion declared. And I want you to notice some things from chapter nine, specifically this morning, of how compassion grows in our heart and lives, and how important this is. First of all, we see compassion declared. David stood up in verse one, he said, is there anybody I can show kindness to? Perhaps you've done that in the past. Maybe, maybe you received a tax return and you said, you know, I want to be a blessing to somebody. I want to be a help to somebody. And you say, well, does that really happen? I, I get people calling me sometimes and they'll say, hey, pastor, is there a missionary that has a need? Is there somebody, I, you know, I have a couple hundred extra dollars I'd like to send this. I can't tell you how many times uh, people have come to me and said, I want to send somebody to camp. I want to help a teenager go to camp. I want a young person that maybe can't afford it. They're from a family that, that maybe even doesn't even believe in sending their kids to camp. But I want to help and I want to be a blessing. And so David stood up and declared, I want to be kind to somebody. And isn't that wonderful if the king stands up and says, can I help somebody? But a lot of people talk and never do a thing about it. They never do a thing about it. How many of you remember Ananias and Sapphira? Who said, we're going to give all but they held back a portion for themselves. It wasn't a sin to keep back a portion. It was a sin to brag about it and not do it. The apostles said, wasn't it yours? Wasn't it in thine power? Couldn't you have kept back a part? You didn't have to give all, but because you said you were, you lied to the Holy Ghost. And they fell down dead at the feet of the apostles. We see that David stood up and he declared his compassion, but we see... Even more important, we see in in verse 5 and 6, compassion delivered. Compassion delivered. Look what it says. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machur, the son of Amniel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Compassion delivered. Do you know compassion is love in action? That's what it is. David, it's one thing for David to declare, I want to have compassion, I want to be kind, but it's another thing to send his compassion outward. He extended his compassion. And by the way, Mephibosheth couldn't come to him on his own. He was lame in his feet. Perhaps he had a wheelchair, perhaps he had some sort of walking sticks, perhaps there was some way, but, but unless somebody came and picked him up and took him to the king, he couldn't climb those mountains and those valleys. He couldn't make the trip from Lodabar to Jerusalem. And so compassion had to reach outward. You know, sometimes as a church family, we just wait for people to come to us. There's a lost and dying world right outside these doors. There's people dying in the streets every day, and you say, oh, we don't see a lot of that in Simcoe. I'm not talking about homelessness necessarily. I'm talking about spiritual death. And they desperately need Christ. And compassion is not just compassion if it's only declared from this pulpit or from our Sunday school classes or in our pews today and say, oh, we want to love the lost and we want to throw out the lifeline and we want to rescue the perishing. It means nothing if we don't go out and rescue them. So compassion was not just declared, but it was also delivered. But I want you to notice the rest of the chapter as we pick up in verse 7. Compassion is not just declared and delivered. Compassion is also demonstrated. And in verse 7, And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. 
And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I give, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son hath food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto thy king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. We see compassion demonstrated. He didn't just bring him in for some sort of show. But we could see that happening, couldn't we? We can see David declaring, I want to be kind. We can see them bringing him into the palace and feeding him a meal and giving him a bath and sending him home again. But no, David said, I'm going to take care of you. The Bible says he restored unto him all the lands that King Saul owned. And Ziba, the chief servant, he says, I want you to take all the servants that you have and I want you to till those lands and I want you to provide fruit and vegetables and I want you to make sure that all of the lands of Saul are being cultivated properly that, that Mephibosheth may have a legacy in this land. But Mephibosheth, I want you to dine at my table. I want you to sit at the king's table and I want you to eat with me all the days of your life. You know, compassion isn't so hard when it doesn't cost us anything. But David was to invest in the life of Mephibosheth. How many of you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Do you know what strikes me about that story? It's not that a Samaritan showed compassion upon a man bleeding. I, I believe every culture, no matter who they are, there doesn't have to be hatred. You can love other people. But the fact that he took money out of his own pocket and he bound his wounds and he gave them the money to the innkeeper to take care of him. And he says, and if it's not enough when I return, I'll pay you more. Compassion wasn't just declared. It wasn't just delivered, but it was demonstrated daily in his life as he invested in that man to help him. David invested in Mephibosheth. We see compassion, a targeted compassion. I want you to see thirdly, a treacherous conspiracy. How many of you like conspiracies? Not when it's against you, you don't. But we see them in the Bible from time to time, and here we see one in 2 Samuel chapter 16. Turn there, if you will. As we progress through the life of Mephibosheth, we see a conspiracy take place to try to ruin his life. And here's the thing. At the end of the day, I don't know who's lying. Either Ziba or Mephibosheth. Now, who was Ziba? Ziba was his servant. He was a servant of Jonathan. Now he's the servant of Mephibosheth. And he's the chief servant that is to take care of these lands. And Ziba comes with a story to David. Later on, Mephibosheth will come with another story. And they don't line up. And, and, and the fact that I don't know they're lying, here's another thing. David doesn't know if they're lying. We can see it in his decision at the end that he just divides it up between them. And so look what it says here in 2 Samuel chapter 16, as we see a treacherous, a treacherous conspiracy. 2 Samuel chapter 16. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled and upon them 200 loaves of bread and a hundred bunches of raisins and a hundred of, uh, a hundred of summer fruits and a bottle of wine. How many of you know that Ziba's already trying to schmooze King David? That's what it feels like, doesn't it? Now, it's one thing just to be a servant, to do your duty. But notice what David says. And the king said unto Ziba, what meanest thou by these? In other words, I didn't ask for these. This was not a command that was extended. I never said, please bring all these provisions up for, the, for my men and to take care of us. Ziba just did it on his own accord, which we would say, well, that's great kindness. But keep reading. 
And Ziba said, the asses before the king's household to ride on, and the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, and where is thy master's son? Where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Ziba came to King David with all these things, bread and wine and fruit, and asses to ride upon. And David said, What is this all this for? And he explained why he brought it. And he says, but where is Mephibosheth? How many of you know Ziba knew he'd ask that question? He says, oh, Mephibosheth is just waiting at home. He figures that today the kingdom of his grandfather and the kingdom of his father will be delivered into his hands. In other words, he's just hoping you'll get killed in battle, David. He's hoping that you'll fail as king. He's at home just, just waiting for things to be handed unto him. By the way, much had already been handed to him. A lot of grace had been extended to Mephibosheth. And if that's all we read in the scriptures, we say, what a scoundrel. He'd been extended such grace and mercy and compassion, and now he's biting the hand that feeds him. But notice what Mephibosheth says in reply. Turn, if you will, to chapter 19. Chapter 19. Look down in verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. Now, here's why I think, I don't know, but I think Ziba is lying. Because if it gets out that Mephibosheth is trying to take the kingdom, what's going to happen to Mephibosheth? Nothing good, I'll promise you that. But Mephibosheth boldly goes down to meet the king. He's not afraid of him. And so the Bible says he comes to meet the king and, and, and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. He was filthy. The king had gone off for a time and perhaps to battle in different things and, and, and as he's gone, Mephibosheth just didn't take care of himself. Oh, there were servants there, but he thought, I'm not going to see the king. I don't have to wash my feet. I don't have to put on clean clothes. I don't have to trim my beard. And so here he comes all disheveled and dirty. In verse 25, and it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth, why didn't you come with me on this trip? You see, Ziba came. Ziba came with donkeys. He came with food and provisions. And David's saying, why didn't you come, Mephibosheth? And here's what Mephibosheth says. Look at verse 26. And he answered, my lord, O king, my servant deceived me. He says, Ziba deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king because thy servant is lame. He says, Ziba told me he was going to go get my donkey. And he was going to saddle it. And I was going to be able to ride to see the king. But he never came back. He just left without me. And so here I am, helpless. And it seems like because of his helplessness and Ziba gone, and perhaps the other servants, he wasn't able to even take care of himself. So he stands before David and he pleads his case. I did not go because Ziba deceived me. And the Bible says in verse 27, and he has slandered thy servant unto my Lord the king. But my Lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. He humbled himself before David. For all of my father's house were dead, were but dead men before my Lord the king. Yet didst thou see thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table? What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? 
And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all. For as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his house. If I am judging between the two, it is my opinion that Mephibosheth is telling the truth and that Ziba is lying. Mephibosheth claims, he says, he has, he has slandered thy servant. He has slandered me. He said, why do you think he's telling the truth? Because he says, when, when David couldn't figure it out, he says, well, here's what's going to happen. I've taken everything and I've given it to Ziba. I've given him all the lands. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide the land. Ziba's going to get half and you're going to get half. Why? I'm assuming because David couldn't tell who was lying. And here's what Mephibosheth said. Let him have it all. It's enough that my king has come to me. It's enough that I dine at your table. Let me ask you, is Jesus enough? I like Mephibosheth's attitude here. And I still, I can't say dogmatically whether he was lying or whether Zeba was lying. I don't really know. Most commentators believe that Zeba was lying. But here's what I know. He was saying, now that I'm back in your presence, O king, it's enough. You're all I need. And as long as I'm dining at your table, I don't need all the rest of those things that you've offered me. Give them all to Zeba. I don't need them. So we see a treacherous conspiracy. But I want you to notice something as we talk about David's compassion. David showed compassion in spite of their treachery. Let me show you one more thing as we, we tell this story, this portrait of compassion, and then we'll move on to the picture of Christ. I want you to notice this, a treaty's condition. A treaty's condition. Turn to 1st, 2nd Samuel chapter 21. We're almost done with Mephibosheth. 2nd Samuel chapter 21. Now this, if you've not read 2nd Samuel before, this will shock you. This will shock you. 2 Samuel chapter 21. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. God was not impressed by Saul slaying the Gibeonites, and so he sent a, a, a famine in the land for three years. And so David, the king, in verse 2, called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and uh, Judah. Now you might remember the Gibeonites had misrepresented themselves and were able to, to move into the land of Benjamin, and there they, they set up camp, and when Saul found out, he wanted to slay them, but he already made a covenant with them, so he did not. But in his anger, he decided to slay them anyway. And God was not pleased. And notice what it says in verse 3. David, son of the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? So David says, I, I want to make amends. I'm going to bring the Gibeonites in, some representative. I'm going to talk to them. And he says, what can I do to make this right? How? I, I, I can't undo the slaughter that took place, but what shall I do for you? In verse 3, and wherewith shall I make the atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, we will have no silver nor gold of Saul. We don't want your money. That's not, what, that's not going to help. Nor of his house. Neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. We don't want you to go and kill any. We don't want you to find who's guilty of this. We don't want you to find some. You know, so to today, they'll still find old war criminals, won't they? Living among us sometimes. And they'll prosecute them for war crimes. And they're saying, we don't want that to happen. We're, we're going to put this behind us. We don't want to go and find some war cri criminals and, and prosecute them. So don't go through and don't you kill anybody on our behalf. And he said, what shall you say that will I do for you? Verse five, 5, and they answered the king, the man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel, so he's talking about King Saul, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto me, unto us, and we will hang them 
up unto the Lord. Do you think God is pleased when men are hung on his be- in his honor? But that's what they said. Give us seven men, the offspring of Saul, that we may hang them unto the Lord. He said, no, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. And the king said, I will give them. Isn't that something? That blows my mind. The thing that the Gibeonites came along and said, give us seven of the offspring of Saul and we will hang them to the glory of God. And David said, no problem. You'll have them by end of day. It's a very different culture than we live in today, isn't it? But notice what it says in the next verse. But the king spared who? Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's what? Oath. That was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Why was he saved? Because there was a condition in their treaty. He and Mephibosheth had come to a place of peace. And though David had already taken some land away from him and given him half back again, he made him a promise, you will dine at my table all the days of your life. And because of the covenant with the king, his life was spared. Do I need to draw that line for you? Because of the covenant with a king, my life is spared. We see a portrait of compassion, but let me show you this morning a picture of Christ. See, how are we gonna do that? We're gonna go through all those points all over again, but very quickly, just in a couple minutes. I want you to notice as we think about a picture of Christ this morning, think about this, can can you see yourself in this story? You say, oh, I'd like to. I'd like to see myself as King David, one who shows compassion. I'm not talking about King David, I'm talking about Mephibosheth broken down by sin, lost and without hope. Can you see yourself as we rehearse those four points again from the portrait that we just painted? I want you to see them in a picture of Christ. The first thing we saw was a tragic condition. Do you know everyone here today without the Lord Jesus Christ is in a tragic condition? We are crippled by sin. We are lost without Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter three, there is none righteous, no, not one. Isaiah 53 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. On our very best day, we are just sinners saved by grace. But if you're not saved by grace today, you are lost just like Mephibosheth. Crippled by sin, and in need of a savior. We see a tragic condition, but we see in the story as we think about a picture of Christ, we see a targeted compassion. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost? That's you. When the Bible says, whosoever will may come, that's you. The Bible says this uh, about our lost and sinful condition. For when we were without strength, yet in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, and yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. Toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came to this earth for you. Christ died on a cross for you. Christ shed his blood for you. The iniquity of us all was laid upon his shoulder. Your sins were placed upon him. When he cried out, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He forsook him because he could not look upon your sin. Those nails that were driven were driven with your name upon them. The spear that plunged in his side and the blood that poured out was because of our transgressions. Friend, he put his, I I like that old song, my, my name was written in his hands. He had me in his heart. How many of you remember that old kind of a southern song? While he was on the cross, I was on his mind. What a, what a great thought. Jesus came for you. I'm so glad that in the Lamb's Book of Life today, it does not say Bethel Baptist Church. 
It does not say they live in Canada in a Christian country. My name is written down. He died for the individual. He paid the price for my sin. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It is a targeted compassion. I dare say today, if you're the only one living on this face of the earth, Christ would have died for you. The Bible says this, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It's a targeted compassion. He died for you. But then we see a treacherous conspiracy in the life of David and Mephibosheth, don't we? We saw the conspiracy of Ziba and Mephibosheth. Let me ask you this. How many times have you fallen? How many times has Satan tried to steal you, to tear you away, to make you fall, to cause you to stumble? How many times have we given in? We say, oh, there's a conspiracy. The devil's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Sometimes our own worst enemy is ourselves. We find ourselves in a treacherous conspiracy. Here's what the Bible says about it. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan is always accusing us day and night. There's a conspiracy, but are you giving in? I'm so thankful that no matter how many times he forgives me 70 times seven, that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. It is a well that will never run dry. I can come to him. That's Christ's compassion. But there was one more thing we saw in that portrait of compassion, wasn't there? There was the treaty's condition. David had struck peace with Mephibosheth and he promised, no matter what happens, you'll always dine at my table. And when it came time to offer men's lives, David said, not Mephibosheth. We have an oath before the Lord. I'm so glad that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that I am placed in Jesus' hand and the Father's hands around that and no man shall pluck me out. I'm so glad that the Bible says he will never leave me nor forsake me. It is a covenant written in the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that once he's saved, he gave me everlasting life. He gave me eternal life. I, I shall never perish because of the covenant of God. They say, oh, but what about the land that was divided? What about the land that he lost? Oh, he whom he loves, he chastens. God chastens me day by day. Works on my life and my heart. But by his compassion, I'm saved. Because he loved me, he died on a cross. And when I put my faith and trust in him, I'm no longer dead. I'm alive evermore. And that seal can never be broken as I'm sealed under the day of redemption. Friend, let me ask you, have you entered into that relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him? He is full of compassion. He didn't just declare his compassion for God so loved the world, but he delivered it that he gave his only begotten son. And today he will still save whosoever will. Do you know him? Have you trusted him? Let's pray. Father, help us, we pray. Will God speak to our hearts? Lord, in the life of David, we see compassion. And Lord, as I begin to study this passage, my mind went to how do we show compassion, but instead I saw a wonderful picture of the compassion of Christ. Lord, though no matter what Mephibosheth did, it didn't matter how dirty he was, how bad he smelt, how his clothes were unkept, yet David showed him grace. I said, why didn't you come with me? You always have a place at my table. God, I'm so thankful for a Christ that loves us in that very same way. Oh God, speak to our hearts today. Maybe there's somebody here today that doesn't know you. They've never trusted Christ. And Lord, they need that compassion today. Not just in word, but also in deed. As Christ will save their soul today if they'd only trust him. Help us, Lord, we pray. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. How about it, friend? Do you see yourselves in the life of Mephibosheth, somebody in need of compassion? Someone who needs the help of the king. Do you see Christ in it? The picture that is painted? I too was like Mephibosheth. Dying in my sins until Jesus came along. The king of kings and lord and lords and extended his hand to me. Do you know him today? What a great song she's playing. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Do you know him today? Maybe there's one say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I, I need to trust Christ. I need his compassion. I need to be delivered from this crippling life of sin. Could we help you today? We'll take a Bible and show you what it means to have eternal life. Is there one that say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. If I were to die today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. Would you slip up your hand? Nobody's looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise you. Is there one? I'm not sure. If I were to walk out of this room today, I cannot say that I'd enter into heaven's gates. I just don't know. The Bible wants you to know. God wants you to have peace. These things have I written unto them that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know today.